Steve. 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 <clears throat> what do you want, Vermin? Edge is on the phone. He was wondering how things were going with the video we talked about. <sighs> what video? I did Paleo Rewind already, so I went into hibernation. What else do we have to do? Well, don't get mad, but we gotta do it again. Damn it, Tim Tim. Well, we would have had it done, but your speaker kind of crapped out right before you went on holiday. So what we already recorded is basically unusable. So we gotta do it again. <sighs> All right. Well, luckily this year has been a much better year for paleontology as a whole than it has been for me personally. And for this year, I decided to cover the discoveries made in April. If you're looking to watch these in chronological order, I fall in right after Atrix at the Paleo Connection who covered March. I'll leave a link to his video up in the top corner. If you haven't checked that out yet, you definitely should. And you should check out all the videos in this series as well. I'll provide links to all of those in the description as they become available leading up to January 1st. I want to thank Edge for once again putting together this annual event. I can only imagine that trying to organize a collaboration between so many content creators is not unlike herding cats. But without further ado, let's get into some of the most interesting discoveries in paleontology for April 2023. First up, we have some newly identified species whose discoveries were first published back in April. The first being a species of bat that was discovered in the fossil lake deposits of the Green River Formation. Now, in general, bats coming out of this fossil location is actually nothing new. There have been several found here over the past 50 years, and this is actually the oldest known site where bats have come from, dating the only group of true flying mammals to the Eocene around 50 million years ago. But of all the dozens of specimens that have been unearthed from Green River over the decades, they have all been identified as one of two different species. That is, until the specimen was found this year, which not only was identified as a separate species, but was also the oldest of the three, pushing bat evolution back another two million years that we know of. Named Icaronicterus gonelli, in addition to being the oldest known bat species, it's also the smallest of the known bats from this Eocene jungle. The Green River Formation is one of the most outstanding fossil sites for that time in the world, right up there with the Messel Pits in Germany. It's constantly yielding amazing discoveries from the time when the world was recovering from the Cretaceous extinction and mammals were just starting to come into their own. But this next discovery is quite a bit older than Eocene bats, but it turns out to be another discovery to come out of Wyoming. This one from the Popo Aggie Formation dates all the way back 230 million years ago during the late Triassic period. This was the time when the very first dinosaurs and pterosaurs were beginning to appear, and the world was finally recovering from the Permian mass extinction, which was the closest life ever came to being wiped out entirely. And as a result, there was a lot of vacant niches available in the Triassic. If you're a follower of my channel, I'm probably repeating myself quite a bit. We talked extensively about the Triassic over the years that I've been making content. And if you're a follower of mine, then you know that this time period has led to a lot of bizarre things in the fossil record that are entirely unlike anything alive today. But one of the most bizarre and arguably most successful during the later half of the Triassic is the Hyperodapodons. These little gremlin lizards kind of took over as the most common group of terrestrial animals after Lystrosaurus died out earlier in the Triassic. But I'll get more into that group as a whole in the next History of the Earth. But back in April, a new genus and species was identified with Bisiwo Kuwus. All right. This find was significant because although hyperodapodonts are pretty common in other areas around this time, they have been pretty much unheard of in the Papuagi formation, or just about anywhere in North America for that matter. Meaning, this discovery shows even more so that these Triassic oddballs had spread across the globe in the latter half of the Triassic. 
Next up, we get to talk about one of my all-time favorite groups of dinosaurs. The group that not only is considered the closest group to birds outside of the Avialans, which are actually the birds, but have oftentimes been depicted as some of the most intelligent of the non-avian dinosaurs overall. The Troodontids. And this time, we found evidence that suggests not only some interesting anatomic findings, but also something that shows behavior. Now, pinpointing the similarities and differences between troodontids and birds has been difficult. But a study done on several well-preserved troodon eggshells have yielded some interesting results. Using a method known as dual clumped isotope thermometry, they were able to determine the internal temperature that troodon bodies maintained during gestation. They concluded that these troodon eggs were produced between 30 and 42 degrees Celsius, or 86 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. And by comparing the isotopic patterns found in these eggshells to what we see in the shells of both modern birds and the closest related reptiles to dinosaurs, we were able to settle a mystery. You see, unlike most other animals, female birds only have one ovary. Because of this, birds produce the shells of an egg much more rapidly than, say, reptiles do, since they can only do one at a time. This rapid creation of the eggshell leaves an isotopic pattern that can be detected. And this isotopic pattern was not present in troodontid eggshells in this study. This suggests that even in dinosaurs as closely related to birds as troodons, still maintained a reproductive system in females comprised of two ovaries rather than the one that we see in birds. And the scientists who made this discovery combined their research with the existing information concerning body and eggshell weight, and they concluded that female troodons could probably only carry around four to six eggs at a time. And this raised an entirely different mystery, because most of the nests that have been found of troodons were quite large, with up to 24 eggs. But it didn't seem that there was any possible way that a female troodon could carry 24 eggs at a time. The explanation for this is that possibly female troodons laid their eggs in communal nests. This would give them a better chance of survival in the late Cretaceous period, where there was an abundance of animals much larger than them, that they would have had to defend their eggs from. This is a behavior that we see in several different species of bird today, one being ostriches, and even in the case of other birds that build in separate nests, they still tend to do so in the proximity of others doing the same thing. I still remember every spring when I would see mockingbirds all nesting in a single tree, and then they would mercilessly dive bomb any squirrel, cat, dog, human, or pickup truck that dared to get too close to the nesting tree. So it's a strategy that definitely works. So in conclusion, it seems that troodons still had a more reptile, or at least non-avian, reproductive system. But once they laid eggs, they adopted strategies that we would normally only really associate with birds. And with that, we now come to the end of April's Paleo Rewind. I apologize for the delay on this video. As I said before, I had the video done, but then ran into some issues that were not able to be fixed before I was pulled away for the holidays. So basically I had to come home and redo the entire thing. And if that's not a metaphor for this entire year, I don't know what is. I want to thank everyone for sticking with me this year. Overall, despite being happy with how things have gone here on the channel, there have been a lot of things that have happened that have slowed down the production of content more than I would like. But I'm hoping with this new year, maybe things will start to pick up again. I want to thank Edge and the rest of the Paleo Rewind team for having me, and direct you to Benji Thomas's video if you would like to watch this series in chronological order. With all that out of the way, Happy New Year, and see you all in 2024.